So welcome. Today we have Aiden Bullish, who's a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he's a collaborator with us on campus where we uh, work on parallel algorithms, and he's a specialist in parallel graph algorithms, and he'll tell us all about those today. Okay. I think this is high enough. Okay. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone. Uh, so I, as Jim said, I'm a um, scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And the slides have uh, been reused. Uh, slides by a lot of folks have been re reused in this lecture. So what's a graph? Um, in a nutshell, a graph is a, is a discrete data structure as simple as a bunch of vertices and edges and um, edges connect vertices and it encodes binary relationships. You can go further and make the relationships uh, more than binary, the ternary relationships uh, connect uh, more than, uh, uh, more than uh, uh, two uh, vertices and it's gonna be called a hypergraph, but I won't be talking any of those today. And you can encode uh, the type of the relationship on the edges and it's, some people call it attributed semantic graphs. You can say, what is this kind of relationship? Is this uh, some sort of phone call or is it a text message? How long does it take? And so on. But some preliminaries, uh, we're gonna stay fairly high level in the algorithmic level. We won't go into those uh, real world scenarios, but you can see where, how they're gonna extend. And uh, N is usually denotes the number of vertices, M is the number of edges, and the diameter of the network uh, or the graph uh, is usually the max maximum number of hops between any two pairs of vertices. Um, in, um, and, of course, you can have, um, uh, again, directed or undirected graphs or weighted or un unweighted graphs. Uh, a path is a sequence of edges so that uh, the, the end point of the first one is uh, the, first, uh, the, the first point of the second one, so it kind of makes a chain, and the length of a path is the sum of the weights of the edges. I will be using some of these throughout the lecture, so that's why it's the first slide. So uh, this is pretty much the outline. I'll start with the applications for motivation, and then I'll go speak a little bit about uh, the general kinds of uh, things that you should be uh, worried about when designing parallel graph algorithms. And I have a lot of case studies. They're not really randomly selected out of all possible. They uh, have, um, there, there's a reason behind it. The first one, graph traversal forms the basis of pretty much every other graph algorithm. Um, shortest paths are, uh, has a lot of applications and that's usually uh, the canonical example. Uh, and there's a lot of different algorithms we're gonna talk about. Ranking, uh, ranking entities on a graph is used in data mining, so we'll be uh, talking about that. And the last two actually uh, are there to, uh, to emphasize some of the parallel algorithm design uh, paradigms in uh, graph algorithms. The first one will emphasize randomization and the second one, strongly connected components, are going to emphasize uh, recursion and divide and conquer. So, um, other applications, you know, you can actually um, think about Google Maps or any other mapping software that you use these days. Uh, how, how does it route uh, when you ask to go from your current location to the other location is really about a point-to-point -point shortest path query. And whether you do it right or wrong uh, makes a lot of difference. So you can see 15 seconds to 10 microseconds, uh, and it doesn't involve any parallel computing at all. It's just about uh, you know, getting the performance right, and that, that's how much difference can it make. Uh, the internet is a graph, uh, so uh, the websites are gonna be vertices there, and the, the, the directed edges uh, are going to be the links from one website to the other one. Uh, so there's the traversal aspect of this. The web search and crawling is a graph traversal. Uh, ranking here is page rank or hits algorithms, depending on how much you, how, how you want to use. And there's a lot of uh, classification and clustering on the graph as well. Of course, uh, the, the whole the internet is a graph on another level because of the way the routers are actually connected to each other. There's a lot of applications of graphs in scientific computing. You've seen some of them, I assume, or maybe all if not all of them. Uh, seriously, um, sparse direct solvers at the end uh, under the covers are all based on some sort of graph paradigm to minimize the fill and maximize the parallelism on uh, when they guide the, 
uh, the factorization pro uh, process. And, um, of course, uh, and then uh, computing the derivatives automatically uh, for, a, uh, for a computer program uh, is reduced to a graph coloring uh, problem. Uh, it's, it's a bit intricate, but it actually works, and people have been working on it for decades. And recently, this technique called preconditioning of a, a linear system to solve the iterative, uh, to, to, to increase the convergence of the iterative systems, um, the, the most recent theory uh, relies on graphs. It's called support graph theory. Uh, there you represent uh, the graph of your uh, adjacent uh, of your matrix of the matrix you're trying to factorize, and you try to approximate that graph with something simpler, the, which in this case is a tree. That's what it's called a support tree. Sometimes you can learn more about so that. If, yeah. Question. So that the last one is referring to the Spielman and Tang uh, uh, algorithm. Yes, it is. Well, there's a long history of right, algorithms right. until then, but I think Spielman and Tang is the uh, is the well latest in the puzzle. And when you talk about derivatives, that's the problem where you have a program and you want to automatically generate a new program that computes the derivatives. That's exactly right. Okay. So um, computing derivatives by hand and giving it the, uh, the the program is the most efficient way. But I can almost guarantee you, you're going to make mistakes when you have. Uh, you know, 20 variables, a uh, couple million uh, equations there, and all of them are in matrix form, and you don't even know how to uh, take derivatives of matrices and vectors. I've, I've spent a couple of months on that. It's not interesting. So the, the programs that can do it automatically rely on graph coloring. And uh, data analysis, of course, these days it's all about big data, and, but this slide predates the big, big data uh, phenomena. Um, Graph abstraction is really useful uh, to analyze complex data. Uh, and these are really three examples, um, astrophysics, bioinformatics, and social informatics. And all of them has different challenges. Astrophysics has challenges about scale and temporal uh, aspects of the data. Bioinformatics has issues with heterogeneity of the data. Different kind of relationships are all encoded. And social informatics uh, have really uh, issues with uncertainty. And you can actually argue that they have all these issues, all of them. Um, the social science, again, Facebook, Flickr, YouTube, all of them are a graph at the end of the day. And um, maybe more science-oriented, something that uh, we've been looking at recently, graph theoretical, theoretical models are used to um, predict the course of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and all of them. And in that aspect, your vertices will be what the neuroscientist calls the regions of interest. Um, so they define it depending on what they can measure by the, uh, the scanning software or the hardware, let's call it. And, um, and the edges are either structural or functional connectivity between those regions of interest. And um, some of the disease indicators um, is deviation from the small world property. Uh, in real world networks are, told, uh, are assumed to have a property called small wordness, which creates a low diameter. So um, it's really uh, the six pairs of uh, separation. The, it goes back to the social experiment where you can send a letter to someone you don't know in pretty much average of six uh, hops. Uh, so you send it to the person you think would know that person, and it forwards it to someone uh, that he knows, and so on. And emergence of some uh, locations uh, called epicenters that uh, matches the patterns of the well-known diseases. So you can actually look at the scan of uh, a patient and tell where it is, where he is in the uh, disease progression. So though all these things, the all application areas, um, what makes this whole um, zoo hard to optimize uh, performance is uh, we have a lot of uh, problems here. Application, yeah. Could you point with a mouse, remember? Oh yes, I will try to stick to the mouse. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so we have all these application areas and a lot of uh, graph methods, we call it. Um, these are higher level graph kernels, not algorithms. Uh, and of course, there's algorithms and they map to architectures. Um, well, it becomes really hard uh, in this big puzzle because for every single application, you will have several algorithms. Um, and what kind of uh, architecture fits best to that algorithm 
uh, or what do you have at hand is uh, might be limited. So you can't really have all possible permutations of this uh, layered graph. Instead, the research in uh, graph algorithms should and is focusing on trying to extract primitives that can be used uh, to, to implement several of these uh, methods and algorithms without uh, re-implementing every single one of them for a different architecture. And, um, and also there's other things that influence uh, the choice of the right algorithm, not only just the ar architecture we have, it's about how sparse the graph is. Uh, the, the algorithms that are fit for dense graphs is totally different than the algorithms that are fit for sparse graphs. Um, whether it's the, the graph is static or changing, the new edges or vertices are coming. Um, what is the vertex degree distribution? If it's too skewed, then it's actually uh, fairly hard to get load imbalance in parallel computing. Uh, but if it's a uniform degree distribution, then you don't need to worry about that. Again, I said multigraph, hypergraphs, problem size, a lot of other things. Um, so uh, I will start um, talking about a little bit of history of how people approach parallel graph algorithms. Uh, first, there was the PRAM model. I think we're talking about 80s. And um, it's an idealized shared memory system. Pretty much all communication bottlenecks are ignored. Um, that's why it's, nobody talks about PRAM at the moment, but this is recorded, so <laughs> I'll be careful. Um, but it created a lot of good theory. At the end of the day, all the successful algorithms, uh, you can trace them back to their PRAM versions. They were not realistic, but you could sit down and make them realistic later on. Um, so you assume an unbound unbounded number of processors, no synchronization costs, so latency is ignored too, uh, not only just bandwidth. And the performance is based on um, the number of operations called the work uh, and the space-time complexity. So we'll, we'll come to that maybe a little bit. Um, the, the advantages are it's really simple, really clean model, easy to analyze a lot of algorithms theoretically. And uh, you can say that uh, it's not bound to the uh, communication network topology like hypercubes or fat trees. It really doesn't matter. Of course, there's a lot of downsides. It's not realistic. Uh, and we know that the main cost today is the communication uh, in parallel uh, computing. So you can't ignore those. And... Um, and and a lot of you know, processors don't stay synchronized. Uh, you will see that um, with the new, uh, I mean, maybe I shouldn't talk about that too much, but you will figure out that your laptop will increase its speed and decrease its uh, speed based on how hot it is. Imagine that all of these processors are uh, connected on a big supercomputer. If one of the racks is hot, then it's gonna slow down. So if, if you don't know how to uh, take the, uh, the the increased load of that slower processor, then you're automatically creating load imbalance. And, um, but they did a great thing, which is instead of implementing every single algorithm from scratch, they figured out some uh, building blocks of uh, PRAM algorithms. So these are uh, prefix sums, pointer jumping, um, early tours, vertex collapse. You can go all back and uh, read about them. They're very really interesting techniques to, um, to actually uh, implement higher level graph algorithms. So um, there's another model which I think is more applicable to today. It's the work span model. Here, uh, it's actually close to uh, the PRAM model. Did, did we ever talk about, did you ever talk about this, Jim? Um, I, I think I had a, a very similar picture when I talked about um, uh, uh, Silk uh, okay, recently. Yes. So that is right. This probably goes back to Silk. So, at least the slides go back to Silk. Um, so it's, it's also very clean. There is only two things to, uh, to think about. One of them is work. And the work is essentially if your computation can be represented uh, as this directed acyclic graph, a DAC, the sum of all these little functions, you, you, let's say, or the pieces of this computation is the work. This is how much time it would take if you run this algorithm serially. No matter how you traverse the stack, it's going to take the same amount of time. Um, a span, on the other hand, is the, the critical path here. So what is the, uh, the longest path from the beginning of the computation to the end of the computation? Because there is the dependency on this thing. 
uh, even if you had infinite number of processors, you wouldn't be able to run faster than this, the length of span. Therefore, actually the sign for span is T infinity. If you give me infinite number of processors, how fast I will run. And I think um, it makes sense. This is still ignoring a lot of communication costs, but it's not ignoring latency. So the span is essentially what many people call latency cost because that's the number of synchronization you should do. And it kind of works fine in shared memory. In distributed memory, this, such an analysis wouldn't work. And the reason we're talking about these things is because I'm going to be referring to some of the work and span costs of the algorithms later on. And these laws are probably irrelevant for this lecture. Let's come to data structures. So um, as I said earlier, it depends on what kind of graph you have. Uh, it's a dense graph, uh, perhaps just keeping a matrix, uh, a real matrix, like two-dimensional array, is just fine. Uh, if you have a sparse graph, you would want something um, much more space efficient. You, you want your data structure to be on the order of the number of edges as opposed to the square of the vertices. And then you're talking about adjacency lists, uh, which is a textbook uh, example, but more, in more in practice, you can use something called a compressed sparse matrix. And I'll um, just talk about it next time. When if it's dynamic, then you have a lot of uh, questions you should ask. Is it how dynamic it is? Is the updates are coming in batches or is it coming one by one? Um, if, if they come really sporadically, then it's really hard to optimize for it. But if they come in batches, you can create a time window and uh, keep a victim queue. And uh, as soon as it's long enough, you can do a batch update. It's going to be high performance. Otherwise, you might have issues. And um, the static graph representation, probably if you don't know your problem and you need a starting point, you should use what's called a compressed sparse row. Um, it's actually used to be a sparse matrix data structure. Um, so um, here is this very simple graph. And um, the four vertices, OK, four vertices here, one, two, three, four. And it's, on the right, you see the adjacency list representation from a, a typical textbook example. For every vertex, there is a, a, a list of outgoing edges. First, uh, where it's going, and the second entry is the weight. Um, the problem with adjacency lists is um, essentially this is a pointer uh, chasing, and it, it will uh, almost invariably create a cache miss. And there's no really need to store that extra uh, memory as well. So you compress those things and create a static data structure that really is a sparse matrix data structure. So you, um, instead of having pointers, you have basically uh, uh, integer indices that goes to the uh, adjacency lists, and you pack all the adjacency lists together into a uh, single array. So you'll see that these are actually packed versions of the adjacency list. And, uh, this can be uh, up to eight times faster than adjacency list if for traversing due, due to contiguous memory access. But that was easy. What happens when you uh, deal with distributing that graph? Let's start with the most naive approach. You can essentially replicate the graph, but you'll see that even though it creates, creates a lot of uh, high performance, you're not going to scale anything beyond uh, you know, a couple of... Uh, a uh, couple of processors if your graph is big. You can do what's called a one-dimensional partitioning, which is very intuitive. Uh, what you do there is you have n vertices and p processors. You say the first n over p uh, vertices goes to the first processor, the second n over p vertices goes to the second processor, and so on. And all the outgoing edges of that uh, vertex go with them. Uh, it's fairly easy, um, but we'll come to the issues with that. Later, um, what's less intuitive is what's called a two-dimensional checkerboard distribution. There, um, it's actually hard to visualize how you would distribute this thing uh, by looking at the graph. Therefore, we use the matrix. Um, so, on the left you see the graph, uh, and on the right it's the adjacency matrix, of course represented as a sparse matrix. You don't store anything that's a zero, and um, you chop this thing into square root of p by square root of p uh, blocks. Uh, and you, I color-coded each one of them for you to see. And the advantage of this approach over the previous one-dimensional approach, I will show performance plots too, but the main 
uh, issue is it will help a lot with the load balance. Imagine a vertex that, uh, that is a hub, meaning that it's connected to every other, uh, every other vertex in the graph. And real world graphs actually has those kind of hubs. And if you do one dimensional partitioning, there is no way to part, uh, split this guy's uh, adjacency list. Whichever processor owns that vertex will have a bottleneck in terms of computation, either storage and computation. And by dividing it in two dimension, 2D, uh, in practice, you're actually alleviating all that uh, bottlenecks. And another advantage will come uh, when we deal with communication. So um, many of these uh, nodes I've actually talked uh, about. So typically, array-based implementations are high performance. So compressed sparse rows should be your first choice. And then you can improve on that. Uh, you want to minimize concurrency. And the question, where is the data? And uh, distributing the data is very important for distributed memory case. And the last question you should always ask is the, the work efficiency of the algorithm. Is my algorithm um, work efficient? That question means the time to, uh, for it to run on P processors uh, times the number of processes I'm using. Is this equal to the serial work? Unfortunately, many of the algorithms won't satisfy this thing. But if it's not satisfied, how close I am to being work efficient? Like, if it's a logarithmic factor, it's probably OK. But if you're uh, something uh, higher than that, maybe it doesn't make sense to actually parallelize your computation for the needs other than actually increasing your available memory. Well, let's come to more uh, interesting pieces. Um, I'll start with the graph traversal because uh, it's the basis of many other algorithms. Let's start with the textbook. Um, how do you traverse a graph? If you, if you ever, ever take an algorithm classes, there are two ways to traverse a graph. And the first one is depth first search. And um, you, you can implement it recursively with this tiny little code on the right. And um, of course, no, you shouldn't implement it recursively. It's going to blow up the stack, but it's easier to, uh, to put the code there. So you follow uh, the first one of the first children you have, and you keep pushing those entries to your stack. So you're going to uh, visit the vertices in a deference way, hence the name. And as soon as uh, you, you have no children to explo uh, explore anymore, uh, the recursion will backtrace, and you'll start numbering uh, the, ver the other uh, edges of the previous vertices. So really, this numbering that I put here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, is all based on where you number. This example numbers vertices in the previsit, which is um, right before calling the recursion, you number the vertex. You would get a completely different numbering if you post-visited, which is you number the vertex after you um, called the recursion. And it's, it can be more than just numbering. You can do different things in this pre-visit and post-visit, and this way you will use draft for search to create a lot of different algorithms. For example, uh, strongly connected components is based on this search, at least a serial version. However, parallelizing this uh, algorithm is a bad idea, and you can theoretically prove that uh, the span of this computation, the critical path, is linear on the number of vertices. Uh, so you won't get too much parallelism. The, the best parallelism you can get is the number of edges divided by the number of vertices. For many interesting graphs, that's a constant number. But uh, in parallel computing, the number of processors keep increasing. Uh, and after 10, 20, uh, whatever uh, processes you have uh, that matches the average degree, you will not be getting any scaling at all. So, and you can read about that. The, a better idea for parallel computing uh, for graph traversal is breadth first search. And this is actually fairly uh, easy uh, to recognize from its name as well. So you traverse your graph uh, layer by layer. Uh, all these vertices that are one hop away from you are visited before you go to any other vertex that is two or more hops away from you. And um, the memory requirements of this um, uh, Traversal is also uh, matching the depth first search one. So uh, the input itself requires the number of vertices plus the number of edges. Uh, you need to keep a tr stack of visited vertices or 
any other data structures you want, and you need to keep a distance array to figure out how far you are from uh, the initial point. When you want to parallelize this breadth-first search algorithm, there is really two different ways of, uh, there used to be two different ways of doing it. Now, uh, luckily, we're in 2013, and I'm going to talk about a third way of doing it. Um, if the first and probably the most obvious way is called the level synchronous approach. There you explore one hop neighbors in parallel together, and once you're synchronized and finished all the one hop neighbors, you go to the second hop neighbors, and so on. And this will, the span of this computation is a D, the diameter of the network, uh, which for sh small word graphs is no big deal because they're almost constant or at most logarithmic. Uh, what if you have a graph that is long and skinny, which happens a lot in genomic graphs because it, it usually resembles a chromosome and the chromosome is long and skinny. It's actually just skinny, but we don't know it yet. Since there's so, so much error, it looks like a graph. Uh, there you need to use some different algorithm, and this uh, algorithm is due to Ullman and Yanakakis. Um, it does, um, it chooses square root of uh, n vertices and does path-limited searches from those square root of n uh, vertices. And once it reaches, figures out uh, its square root of n boundary, it, um, it contracts each one of those uh, square root of n vertices to super vertices and runs an all pair shortest path between them. It's actually more efficient if you have a skinny graph, but I don't actually um, know of any high performance implementations at this point. So what is the new kid in the block here? Um, it is, um, it's this observation um, of how much time is spent in each one of the, uh, the phases on the level synchronous algorithm. So this is um, the percentage of total, the, um, the black line is the number of vertices on the current frontier and the red line is the execution time. As you can see, the bigger the frontier, the more time you're spending. And it looks like 80% of uh, the time uh, is spent on a couple of iterations in the middle when the frontier is huge. And this is a real uh, network. In fact, uh, if you use a synthetic network, uh, like the one that's used in a, a common benchmark called Graph 500, things are more severe. Uh, so I will want you to look at the, uh, the figure on the right. Here, um, this slide is due to Scott Beamer, uh, one of your colleagues. As, um, at every step, of course, the number of steps is smaller than on the left because this is a different graph. But um, you'll see that the dark blue is actually all the successful attempts to claim a child. The way the algorithm works is everybody tries to find the vertices uh, in the next layer. Right, and uh, I'm looking at my outgoing uh, adj adjacency, and I try to claim uh, one of those um, vertices. If it wasn't visited, I say, okay, this should be my child. Uh, but there's a lot of other checks too. It could be my peer, meaning that we can be in the same uh, level in the graph, first, uh, graph, but I don't know until I check it. So I need to do this redundant check, and it's the light blue one. Our uh, verse is, I can be checking the right vertex, which is another layer, but one of my peers might have claimed it before me. Since this is a parallel algorithm, I actually don't know whether somebody else already checked it, especially in distributed memory. It's, it's really hard to figure out if that is already uh, claimed or not. So you do redundant claims, and at the end of the uh, uh, iteration, you synchronize and figure out that you've been doing redundant work all over the place. Uh, so Scott's algorithm, is based on this observation. When the frontier is at its peak, almost all examinations fail to claim a child. And um, so he said, well, why have parents trying to find their children if only one out of 50 checks is gonna succeed? We have very few children left, or maybe not, but even if it's not very few, um, there is a smaller percentage of vertices left. Why don't we have those unclaimed children trying to find their parents instead. That's a very uh, simple intuition, but it works. Uh, so uh, you see um, on the figure on the left is the execution of a typical top-down algorithm. So the root is numbered zero, and all the, the current frontier is numbered one, because it's one hop away. And the edges, 
that has the arrows are the edges that you're checking at that iteration. So you're essentially doing um, one, two, three, four, I, I can't even count. There, you do a lot of edge checks. Uh, More than 10 uh, edge checks. So that's, it. that's when you're at level one. The arrows are when you, the level yes. one checking. You're going from uh, the first frontier to the second frontier. That's right. And um, as you will see, just look at uh, this particular vertex here. Uh, only one of them, uh, only one of these ones will claim it, but two of them will check it. Whereas so many people are checking to claim zero, which has already been discovered, so there's no need to check it at all. Instead, uh, the bottom-up algorithm works with the unclaimed vertices, which in this case is the ones that are not colored, uh, colored white, and they look uh, to their incoming edges and try to find a vertex in the current frontier. And, this will, and the advantage of this approach is they can just break as soon as they find something. They don't need to check every single edge. So once, they, once this uh, white uh, vertex finds apparent, then it doesn't need to check any other edge. So that's the idea of the heuristic. And um, of course, this won't work if you execute it bottom-up all the way. The smartness comes from switching from top-down to bottom-up during the execution. Uh, and there's a, we should read the paper for the exact heuristic uh, on how to do that. Uh, but I'll, uh, I should say that it's actually surprising that there was something uh, still to be discovered on this simple algorithm. Okay, so uh, this, uh, the next, I'm going to show a different way of doing bread first search uh, by doing just some sparse matrix algebra, and it's going to tie back to uh, distributed memory distributions. The reason I'll be doing this is it's much easier to motivate how the data is distributed if you know what it means to look at the sparse matrix. So on the left top corner, you see the graph, and on the right, you see it's transposed adjacent to matrix. So uh, how do you do breadth first search on this graph by just doing uh, matrix vector operations? It all boils down into um, setting a right-hand side vector with their starting vertex. Here it's going to be called 1. Uh, and you're going to number it with whatever you uh, started with. And after the first iteration, you'll, you'll discover, after the first sparse matrix, sparse ve uh, vector multiplication, you're going to discover your first frontier, which I colored with green. And you will swap that back uh, to your right-hand side and do another uh, metric, and you'll discover your second uh, hop vertices. As you probably can see, this is no different than doing bread first search. But it's for conceptual uh, descri description, it's, it's a bit uh, easier to look at the, uh, the matrix, and it's easier to figure out where the data access patterns are and how to distribute the matrix. In fact, we're going to use this intu intuition uh, to say what we mean with one-dimensional distribution, right? Now it's much more clear why we call this distribution of distributing vertices to processors is called one-dimensional. Uh, it's essentially this splitting the matrix in a one-dimensional one way, and all the vertices, um, all the outgoing edges go with that vertex. And the algorithm to do breadth-first search in distributed memory is only three lines. Do a local... Uh, frontier search, find the owners of the uh, current frontier's adjacency locally, and then exchange all the things you found uh, to whomever owns that vertex. This step uh, is the communication cost, and it involves an all-to-all -all communication among all P uh, processors. And finally, update uh, all the, um, whomever owns the vertices, once they get the uh, uh, updated adjacencies, they're going to set their parents and distance where distances for the unvisited ones. There might be a lot of spurious updates, but it's the owner's job to figure out which one it's going to go. On the other hand, if you do checkerboard uh, distribution, uh, a two-dimensional distribution, perhaps it's more clear now to see what a two-dimensional distribution is. You split uh, your uh, sparse matrix into square root of p, square root of p blocks, and um, you'll see you, uh, what it means on the graph, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive what it happens in the graph, but you don't need to think about it. The algorithm is now a little different. Uh, there is two communication steps, and the reason for that is I can't do a local discovery 
unless I, I gather all the adjacencies of that vertex. So therefore, I have to first do a, um, the gather of all the, uh, all the vertices in, in the co processor column dimension. And then, uh, then I'll do my local discovery. Uh, once, I, uh, once I'm done with that, I will exchange the, uh, the adjacencies in the processor row. And finally, the owners are going to update just as before. So why, would, why did I take an algorithm that does only one step of communication and made it two steps of communication and call it better? Uh, it's all about how many processors are actually contributing to that communication. Uh, before, it was an all to all among all vertices. And if you're dealing with um, tens of thousands of processors, a communication of all to all is very unscalable. Uh, uh, if you're limiting it to only the processor row and column, that's actually a very small subset. Just think about the numbers. If you have just 10,000, speaking with 10,000 people is a chaos where you can actually split them into groups of uh, 100. Each one of them has only 100 elements, and that's kind of how the, uh, the classrooms run. And that actually, in practice, is faster, and I'm not going to talk too much about it. Uh, the, the only bottom line in this figure is uh, the higher is better, and the blue one is two-dimensional, uh, so it's better. Yeah. So could you say what the vertical axis means? Yeah, um, I didn't want to go too much about the performance. Yes, I can. Uh, so the, the horizontal axis is the number, of course. And the vertical ax axis is different for the two graphs. The one on the left, it's called gigateps. What that means is um, billions of edges traversed per second. And it's very uh, close to the performance score used in top 500, which is you know, uh, floating point operations per second. Here we're uh, counting how many edges we traverse per second. So here the uh, higher is better. The figure on the right, on the other hand, is the communication time and of, uh, of the whole computation as well. And that there is the lower is better. And you'll see that the two-dimensional algorithm actually is not only more smooth in terms of performance because it doesn't hit the, uh, the corner cases uh, of uh, big all-to-alls, uh, it's also um, faster, too. But what happens, we already talked two, two good ideas. One of them is two-dimensional distribution, and the other one is the new direction optimizing search. What happens when you combine those two ideas? You actually get a huge benefit. Uh, it's very, uh, that's, that's not trivial, because um, we talked about uh, the new direction of uh, bottom-up algorithm uh, you know, um, stopping uh, the execution as soon as it finds a parent. If a child finds a parent, it stops the execution. It's very easy to implement this in serial. You say you write a loop and you break as soon as you find a parent. It's really hard to do it in distributed memory because then all your other processors will still be trying to find parents. And there's a balance of parallelism versus work efficiency there. Um, I think we've... Uh, some satisfactory solution. There might be some better things uh, that we couldn't find yet. But it looks like uh, the performance on the light blue is the top-down two-dimensional algorithm, which, is, which was already better than the one-dimensional algorithm. And it, I thought it, it, it was as good as we would get. But instead, uh, uh, a direction-optimizing approach using the two-dimensional distribution is up to eight times faster. And you'll be able to uh, do the same uh, x-axis uh, and y-axis as the previous one. So here is the number of processors, here is the, num uh, the search rate, uh, gigateps, and what this really means is, let's figure out, the input in the biggest case is a, vert, uh, is a graph with a quarter tri trillion edges. And you're, you're traversing that graph, all of it, in pretty much 1.2 seconds. So that, I think, is pretty interesting. Question. Yeah. So the hybrid uh, traverses fewer edges, right? That's its advantage? Yes. So, so is counting edges per second the right thing to compare? Well, I think th it is. Because then if you're doing, for example, if you know Strassen's algorithm, um, it's not doing n-cube operations. But when you report the mega uh, flops of the Strassen algorithm, you still 
rely on the computation being n cube and divided by the time stress so in this. So that's what you're doing here? Yes. Okay. So, so the see. assumption is the number of edges uh, that would be traversed in the uh, naive top-down okay. algorithm. Thank you. Yes. W one more yeah. question. The, um, the linear algebra analogy you make is you multiply times A transpose and then you keep multiplying by uh -huh. A transpose. So we studied that in an earlier lecture and called it the matrix powers kernel. That's right. And, and so is that optimization that we talked about worth taking advantage of? Uh, that's actually something we've been thinking, but so far, no, because there's, uh, it's not, the computation is not very data-driven. And you know you will take k steps. At this algorithm, I don't even know if there is even k steps to take. Um, it's, not, there is, it's not very mathematical. The breadth-first search is about traversing a graph. And in, many, in every step, you're doing some sort of computation. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to take k steps, um, I don't know what mathematically does it mean. Uh, in, your case, uh, in the sparse uh, iterative solvers case, uh, there, there is a uh, mathematical definition to it. You're talking about the Krylov space, uh, subspace. Here's um, the graph might be only one hop away. So I, I'm still hopeful that there is something there, but... Uh, but it's an not, open question right it's now. It's a very open question. That's right. Okay, let's move on to uh, shortest paths. So how much time? We have 37 minutes or something, uh, which is good. So, single source shortest paths. Um, probably the, the first thing people think when they talk about graph algorithms. And um, how many of you have heard about these names called um, Dijkstra and Bellman Ford in some other class? Okay, so pretty much everyone knows about these things. Uh, and um, other than their names, what else do we know? We know that Bellman Ford is called label correcting. What that really means is once it processes a vertex, it doesn't mean that vertex is finished. It might always come back to that vertex and resettle its, uh, uh, its distance. So it looks like a real iterative algorithm. And it, it, you can talk about convergence in bellman fort And the proof of bellman fort complexity is actually based on how fast it's going to converge. Dijkstra, on the other hand, is a greedy algorithm. It's called label setting. Once it processes the vertex, it's done. It, and the proof is uh, that there is no other path that can actually come to that already processed vertex in a shorter length. So you're done with that vertex, you can forget about it. But it doesn't work uh, with uh, graphs that has negative edge weights. So it's kind of restrictive, but it's still a genius algorithm. Um, in parallel, even in PRAM models, there is no algorithm that ru runs in sublinear time and when I say time, it's really the span, actually. Uh, but that's the PRAM terminology. And uh, even, uh, you know, and, and be work efficient, which is, uh, this is the performance of the Dijkstra in serial. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of different uh, algorithms here. Um, specifically, we'll start with the delta stepping algorithm, which um, is a middle ground from Bellman Ford to Dijkstra. Now let me start with that. So it's a label correcting algorithm in a way, but uh, it's, it looks like a bucket implementation of Dijkstra. So in Dijkstra, you're always taking a step uh, so that you're reaching the, among all the vertices that you haven't visited, the closest one to you. Here, uh, we know that if I just work with that kind of uh, approach, it won't be parallelizable because I'm always looking at the next closest thing. Next closest thing. And where would the parallelism come from? It, would, it wouldn't come from anywhere. So delta stepping tries to uh, mitigate that problem by uh, keeping tra track of all the vertices, unvisited vertices that are a delta step away from you. So it keeps buckets of delta distances. One delta away, two delta away, three delta away, and so on. Uh, and you can see that by different uh, delta choices this algorithm degenerates into well-known algorithms. If delta was smaller than the edge weight in the whole graph, it, you would get the extra. And if delta was so big that it, would, it was bigger than every edge, then it actually would become Bellman Ford. So by choosing it somewhere in between, you trade parallelism for efficiency. 
here's what the algorithm does. The analysis is a bit uh, tricky because it's hard to prove that this algorithm is good for every single graph. So the analysis actually assumes a lot of things about the degree distributions. I won't go into the details. Um, so here's a graph, and uh, let's say I chose delta 0 0.1, and the distances are all infinities because I've just started. Um, and one parallel phase is defined as a period uh, where I'm going to process uh, delta's uh, hop uh, neighbors. So I'm, I'm going to differentiate uh, edges between light edges and heavy edges. And what light edges mean that anything that is less than delta length is a light edge. Anything that's more than delta length is a heavy edge. The trick here is if I process a light edge, uh, the other end of the, uh, the edge, my neighbors, might still go back to the current bucket. But if it's a heavy edge, since it's more than delta length, it's never going to go enter my bucket. So I don't need to loop over that. I can just do all the heavy edges at the end in a single step. So I'm going to inspect the light edges and construct a bunch of requests. So for this interest, I found two uh, as the only uh, light edge. So I insert it. And um, now I can remove zero. Um, uh, from the list. I call it deleted vertices, but again, this is label correcting. Deleted means it's not done yet. I'm just deleting it from my current uh, data structures and put it in something called S. I'm going to deal with it later. And then, now I have uh, two, and I'm going to inspect all the light edges of two, which are uh, the, the, the red edges, these two edges, and I'll be able to reach one and three, and Again, do the same thing. Um, they, they, it, notice that everything I process still falls into the same bucket. So I'm, everything I've processed so far, 0, 2, 1, and 3, still falls to the 0 bucket. But uh, once it's actually um, done, meaning that I have no light edges to process, because notice that after this point, every edge I'm left is a heavy edge. Now. I can look at all the vertices I processed, 0, 2, 1, 3, and look all of their uh, heavy outgoing edges. And I can relax all of them at once. That's most of the parallelism. That's where most of the parallelism comes from. And I will be, but they will fall into different buckets. You'll see that um, this will fall into a different bucket than this guy. This will fall to the sixth bucket, while this will fall to the first bucket. Okay, all depends on how, how big that um, edge is. So the performance really depends on the number of phases of this uh, uh, operation. And that, in turn, depends on the input. So if you're dealing with a low diameter input, it's good. The number of phases is small. You have a lot of parallelism. If you have a high diameter graphs, uh, you might have issues with this algorithm, as usual. So, so here, the horizontal axis is different families of graphs? Yeah. They're just different graphs. And uh, uh, the y-axis is the number of phases. And we call that the level synchronous spread for search had the same problem, pretty much. And um, if all, of course, the perf complexity is not only dependent on the number of hops or the phases, it also depends on the distance. This is kind of output sensitive algorithm. Um, and in fact, the complexity is, in the best case, is, num is linear, number of vertices, number of edges, plus the diameter times the maximum shortest path distance. So if you have a long shortest path, uh, then you'll need to process a lot of uh, edges um, and a lot of phases. So that will create a little bit of an issue. But in practice, it's actually decent. I'm going to talk about, so just to summarize, this algorithm is um, a good compromise between uh, the performance of Dijkstra and the parallelism of Belmont-Fort. And you can set the, uh, uh, the delta to be the right value to get a lot of parallelism. The trouble is, a fixed delta might not work. Um, if you're gr you can create actually peculiar graphs that there is no optimal delta. Whatever delta you choose, you will have a lot of uh, phases. Uh, but luckily, those uh, awkward graphs do not exist uh, in real world, just like uh, some matrices where the Gaussian elimination would create unbounded error does not usually exist. So. Uh, so it's fine. 
But another algorithm is particularly interested, uh, interesting for perhaps longer diameter graphs. So this is specifically designed for road networks. It's called FAST. I don't think it's the best name, but it's, uh, it's a great algorithm. It's called Hardware, hardware Accelerated Shortest Path Trees. The basic idea behind the algorithm is when you go to a highway, when you go to one place to the other, if I wanted to go to some random street in San Francisco, the way I route is I first go to 80, and I take the bridge and go down, right? So why not simulate that idea in the algorithm? So you create an arbitrary, of, you, it can be arbitrary, but essentially not so arbitrary hierarchy of vertices. So um, the, the, the highest level you can think of as the highway, and the lowest level think of the alleyways on the street. And um, so what's going on here is when you try to go from one point, let's say four, to the other points, you will do an upsweep uh, to the highway, and you will do a downsweep from the highway back to where you're going. But uh, it's not just that. It's, uh, it's also based on a pre-processing, meaning that how do I get to the, uh, uh, to the destination is you can put shortcuts in your graph. So you can pre-process the graph and put all the shortcuts in place and then follow those short shortcuts. Uh, so this is the main idea, shortcutting and highway hierarchies. So just an example. Um, you run, a, you try to find the path uh, from S to everyone else. So S is your starting vertex. You run a forward search only looking at uh, uh, edges that go to more important nodes. So you only look up and you set the distances to, uh, in this case, to five and seven. Once you reach the highest node, you do a down sweep. The up sweep is typical, like the extra, everything else. The down sweep is where it's interesting. You don't need to keep a priority queue or any kind of data structure because the down sweep is independent of the source. I mean, if I did start my calculation, instead of starting from uh, the vertex that I labeled S, if I started from one, how would I do the down sweep? I would still go to the vertex that's now numbered seven and I would do a down sweep. Right? Only the up sweep is input dependent. The down sweep is really dependent on the numbers. So its data access pattern is fixed, the numerics is different. But it doesn't exactly matter too much. So since the, the data access pattern is fixed in the down sweep, I can optimize for that and reorder the vertices for maximum locality and maximum parallelism. So that's, that's about the idea. Uh, and the rest is typical. You just follow the triangle equality, set the vertices. You just don't need a, a priority queue and reorder this thing and do a linear sweep is fine. Looks like, uh, so how much performance increase would you expect this uh, algorithm to give you compared to the extra? Any guesses? Just. I mean, this is just actually a great illustration of how much it matters to access the data the right way. So, so how would the algorithm know that if I wanted to go from S to uh, its lower right neighbor, you shouldn't go up to the highway first, because S is closer? Uh, but uh, the single source shortest path is defined as um, a source to every other vertex. So you will find, you, will, you need to sweep everyone anyway. So the output is, a tree that lets you find the distance from the source to everyone else. What you're saying is a point-to-point -point query. It's a, it's a different problem. So here we see the, how much difference does it make. Um, so uh, the second column is the device used, um, and the, the time is uh, here for different uh, kind of road networks. Um, this, using the same device, we're talking about the performance increase from, let me pick something, um, you know, 170 seconds to four seconds, which, which looks pretty impressive to me. And you can implement this on the GPU because you regularize the data access patterns. So that's kind of the tr crux. If you, yes. So this is all stride one, because it's all stride one memory access? Yeah, in the down sweep. Okay, that's, so 
And did, you can did, did they quantify that? Uh, yes, you can quantify that because, uh, uh, no, okay, here's the two things. This algorithm, actually, is the next slide. Uh, it is not so easy to quantify, mm -hmm. okay. and, and I'm coming to that. Um, in road networks, this works beautifully uh, because the shortcuts we've added is not too much. Um, in, in a network uh, like a social network, I don't know why you would do uh, distance calculations in short, uh, short, short, that's a different question. Uh, let's say you have a network that doesn't have a good separator, if you remember that the uh, theorem about uh, separators, then you would have a lot of fill. The shortcut edges will be a lot. And then, of course, the downsweep performance depends on how much shortcut edges I've inserted into the graph. In this one, it's bounded uh, by uh, really just a linear uh, term uh, on the number of edges. Uh, but on a, on a graph that doesn't have good separators, you will have a lot of fill and the performance would degrade. So that's, that's pretty much uh, why it's hard to quantify. It depends on what happens during preprocessing. And, and you'll, you'll see that the, the whole shortcut idea is no different than uh, factorizing uh, a sparse matrix and creating fill for that and, and running triangular solves. This is, uh, the data access pattern is pretty much the same. Conceptually, I, d I don't exactly know how they correspond to each other. Okay, lastly, something new under the hood. This I've talked about was all from finding the shortest paths from a single vertex to everyone else. What if I want to find the shortest path from everyone to everyone? It's called the all pair shortest path. And uh, it might be the best way to actually answer the queries of distance and time uh, if you had the opportunity to pre-process everything, you would put all the, uh, you know, resp you will solve all page shortest paths, store it somewhere. Whenever somebody wants to go from one place to the other, you just look up, what was it? I just already computed it. Of course, it's hard to store the whole result, uh, but if your graph is particularly dense, then it's actually uh, okay because there's no extra storage. So the input is a directed graph, cost on edges, all pairs shortest path. The classical algorithm is called Floyd Warshall. It's a triple nested loop. And uh, it, the, the induction is over all uh, case. So you can think of it, the data access pattern is doing an outer product of the, uh, the Kate row and the Kate column and updating the whole, whole matrix with the equation that if it's, uh, if, this, if it's smaller, if it's faster to go to uh, the vertex K, uh, so you go from I to K and K to J. If that is faster than directly going from I to J, then you set the distance uh, to the sum of that guy, the typical uh, triangle equality relaxation. But it turns out that um, a previously overlooked recursive version of this algorithm is better for parallelization. This algorithm is a little harder to parallelize, first because the induction sequence, if you, you can't reorder the K loop. You can reorder the i and j, but if you change the location of k, uh, you might actually uh, get wrong results. That's the whole uh, idea that Floyd Virtual is based on. Second is it's doing other products one by one is, uh, doesn't have a lot of data reuse. You would like to do other products uh, of like bigger chunks of uh, column sets and row sets to get better locality. And a recursive version of this algorithm does exactly that. Instead of working, uh, you know, column and row out of products, it, 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 this is a reschedule of the algorithm, and it's hard to see why they're equivalent, but they are, believe me. It uses a lot of uh, matrix multiplies, but on a different semiring. So think about matrix multiply, where every addition operation is replaced by a minimum operation, and every multiplication operation is changed to an addition operation. That's called the tropical semiring. And if you do the recursive algorithm, that looks awful like uh, a recursive version of LU with, without the, uh, the top corner. The LU doesn't have the top corner, top left corner, but this one does. You see that this algorithm is actually going to find you all the paths. So the idea is that you split your matrix to A, B, C, D corners, and you first find all the paths that stay within A. Then you find all the paths that goes from A to B, and then, uh, uh, and then 
uh, C to A back and all the paths that go from A to D through that path and so on. And you can uh, later play with this execution to convince yourself this actually works. I, uh, for, I put a, um, you know, first couple of uh, iterations of this algorithm for, for you to play with, but I'm not gonna go over it. Essentially, uh, it's all about uh, what I said. Every time you find a shorter path, you update the parent as well. So the parent's matrix actually um, is, gonna, uh, is gonna give you the path itself. This is only gonna give you the distance and you can follow the parent's matrix to find the actual path. In practice, uh, this is really fast. So, uh, so what are we uh, showing here? The x-axis is the dimension of the, uh, the matrix or the number of vertices of the graph in a logarithmic sense. So this is a log-log plot. And the y-axis is the time in milliseconds. Uh, on my laptop, the performance of classical algorithm is the light green curve. If I directly ported that algorithm, the outer product Floyd Virtual to GPU, I don't exactly gain too much. It's still as bad as my laptop. Of course, this is an older GPU, but fine. But if I did the recursive implementation without optimizing it, I would get the black curve. If I used an optimized version of the matrix multiply, which is written partially by one of his, uh, Jim's students, uh, Vasily, you get something of a 480 times speed up from where you started with. So actually, um, locality works um, in the short. And, and you can utilize this algorithm to have, to implement it in distributed memory in what we call a communication avoiding way. I don't know if you talked about those things already. So uh, you all know that um, by you know, judiciously using uh, extra memory and doing some sort of replication up to a factor of C, you can uh, gain a lot of uh, bandwidth. You can get a lot of bandwidth reduction um, uh, to have a lot meaning that's square root of C, which is a lot at the end of the day. And this algorithm uh, needs to do a lot of cyclic and block steps. And the reason I should actually point this out is think about parallelizing a recursive algorithm like this. And um, it's okay, it starts as a whole graph, so this is distributed to every processor. Once I start the recursive call, what will the other processors do? Like, they're not gonna sit idle, right? I'm not gonna divide my processor space to four and let the other guys sit idle. But if I divide it too much, then I'm uh, losing a lot of, uh, uh, of the locality. But if I don't, uh, if I don't divide it, uh, then I'm losing load imbalance. So the trick to get the, uh, the theory right and a good bound is to do cyclic steps followed by block steps and the numbers of those are pretty, needs to be pretty precise to match the lower bound. But in the, in the end, you can do it. And what you get here is you can strong scale an all pair shortest path al algorithm by increasing the replication size C. So the, in the X axis, you see the compute nodes. In the Y axis, you see the gigaflops you get from this operation. And, um, if you didn't do any replication, uh, for example, for the smaller problem size, you would start slowing down after the 16 compute nodes, but then you start replicating because now you have a lot of available memory that you don't use, and you replicate four times, you keep getting faster. As soon as you would st slow down, because again, there's not enough uh, parallelism left, you can do a little more replication to up to 16 per, uh, use the, fill all that memory and keep continuing to scale. So it kind of works. Of course, an open problem is how do I uh, make other uh, communication avoiding algorithms for graphs? That's open question, a lot. So I have about 15 minutes. Um, I will particularly, um, I'm, I would like to talk more about different techniques and parallelism than to talk about between a centrality. But in a nutshell, a between, uh, between a centrality is one way of ranking vertices in a graph. Like if you have Facebook graph, you want to figure out the person whom you would like to target first for advertising. So uh, because you think he's influential. 
And how do you do that? One way. It's a very expensive way of doing it because that computation is actually quadratic, uh, or actually worse than quadratic, uh, but, it, but only by a log factor. Um, between a centrality is a simple measure that says, among all the shortest paths in this network, what fraction of them are passing through me? That's my between a centrality. But computation of it, as you can think about, is not so easy. Um, simplest way is, it's based on shortest paths, so why, why not calculate all pair shortest paths and use that output as a between a centrality? Good, but except that all pair shortest path is cubic. And I said already quadratic is too much. Imagine the cube of Facebook network. You're not going anywhere with that. Uh, so the Brandis algorithm is, works for both um, undirected and directed graphs, but I'll talk about the undirected case only. It uh, figures out what the dependency structure for every vertex is, and then uses that dependency structure to have a recursive accumulation of between the scores. Here's a um, high level idea. You do a level synchronous parallel breadth for search uh, from, the starting, from every starting vertex, every single starting vertex. And then once you finish that, from every uh, end vertex, you do a backwards tallying step to count the scores. So both of them can be implemented as augmented breadth first searches. So all the techniques that we've talked in the beginning of the lecture are applicable here. You'll just change the way you do the uh, updates. Instead of just touching them and setting its parents, you're going to do a little more arithmetic as you're doing the breadth first search. So here's references for shared memory versions. And here's an illustration of the algorithm. So the traversal is, again, breadth first search. But look what, what I'm doing. Instead of just keeping a distance, I'm also keeping a, a multi-set of all the parents. So uh, just to point out the vertex 3 here, vertex 3's distance is 2, but I'm keeping a, a multi-set of 2 and 7. Why is that? Because I can come to 2, uh, I, I can come to vertex 3 from both vertex 2 and vertex 7. I have to keep track of all of them. And why is it a multi-set is because I have to keep track of if it happens twice, if I can come uh, to seven in two different ways, which in this case is the, is the one, I can come to seven from zero in two different ways, I have to keep track of both of them because that's going to change the between a centrality score. So once I keep track of those things, I'm going to go from every end vertex backwards and use the formula of, given by Brandis uh, do some number crunching and get my numbers. It's, it will take a little longer to digest this, but it actually is a pretty neat algorithm. So, illustrates the techniques that we have learned. In distributed memory, you can essentially do this um, running breadth first search from every starting vertex by doing a sparse matrix, sparse matrix multiplication. So, I've already talked about how to do single breadth first search by sparse matrix sparse vectors. If you, if you make your right hand side uh, matrix uh, vector a matrix, stitch together all the vectors, then you are doing breadth first search from several starting vertices all at once, and you're getting all the parallelism together. So you're going to do these iterations for forwards and same iterations for backwards tallying, and you'll encapsulate all three levels of parallelism that is inherent in between a centrality. Because you're uh, parallelizing over columns of B, you're doing multiple breadth first search searches in parallel. Because you're parallelizing over rows of B and columns of A transpose, you're parallelizing the, um, uh, the axes of the frontier vertices. And finally, the rows of A transpose, you're parallelizing for the incident edges of each frontier vertex. So whatever is in there to exploit, you're exploiting it. All right, two techniques. Uh, these are luckily the lightest algorithms to actually think about. Maximal independence set. So what is maximal independence set? This is for, to illustrate uh, the randomization and how powerful can it, be, it can be on uh, uh, designing graph algorithms. Um, so a, a set of vertices is called independent. If, uh, if, if, if a set of vertices is independent, then no two of them are neighbors. So its uh, definition is meaningful. A maximal independent set is 
I'm going to give you a set of vertices who are independent, and you're not, gonna ch you're not allowed to change the set. You can only add to that set, and you can't add to that set, meaning that it is maximal, no way to increase it by adding more vertices. A maximum, on the other hand, is among all possible independent sets, which one is the maximum, which is a harder problem, MP-complete, MP-hard, and I'm not going to talk about that one, but maximal is usually good enough for a lot of applications. For example, you can see that the 5 and 4 are an independent set, and also it's a maximal independent set because I can't add any other vertices to 5 and 4 and still have an independent set. But I could pick another set, of set which doesn't include 5 and 4. It would be bigger, that's, therefore it's not maximal. The, alg the algorithm is, you know, sequential algorithm is very sequential. It's a for loop. And you start with a random vertex, let's say one, and um, you go over all the vertices. If it's not a neighbor of already claimed vertex, you add it. So two, three, four doesn't work, but five, five wasn't there, so I add it. And then six, six wasn't there, I add it. Seven and eight, I can't add them, so it's done. Uh, its work is linear on the number of vertices. Uh, and, but its span is also linear. So since you're iterating over all vertices, your critical path is pretty bad. How do you get a better uh, span? Is You do this randomized algorithm due to Michael Luby, which happens to be a Berkeley graduate a long time ago. Uh, so you, every vertex in your graph finds a, a, tosses a coin, or not a coin, uh, generates a random number for itself. So, right, so everybody generates a random number, uh, and then everybody looks at the random numbers their neighbors have generated. Okay, so if, if my random number is smaller than the random numbers of all my neighbors, I claim myself as part of the independent set. So in this example, uh, one and five figure out that their numbers are smaller than their all, all their neighbor's numbers, so they add themselves to the independent set. And what I take out from the, uh, the C, which is the unclaimed vertices, is not only just one and five, I take out all the neighbors of one and five from the candidate set as well, which is C, so it's gone. The trick is, at the first iteration, the reason neither eight nor six is claimed is there is a, there is a funny uh, cyclical dependency there. So, uh, six can't claim itself because there's four, and eight can't claim itself because there's six. So the algorithm, that's why it takes a couple of iterations to converge to the maximum independent set, but it does. Um, you know, with very high probability, this algorithm actually finishes in log n rounds, so it gives you a much better span, but it increases the work a little bit too. So you have a lot of more parallelism, you're doing a little more work. In practice, it's very fast. And final application, final case study is strongly connected components, which is just like the other things we've studied, uh, is a, can be a very uh, strong building block. The serial algorithm is, uh, where is this? Oops. The serial algorithm uses depth first search to find uh, strongly connected components. And this picture is only to show what happens once you permit the edges for strongly connected components. So the definition, of a strongly connected component is every vertex can reach every other vertex following directed paths. So it's defined in directed graphs. And um, you see that from five, um, five is a strongly connected component of itself only because, um, because there is no way to get uh, from three to five, for example, or from six to five or any other thing. Five can only reach to itself and come back. And the, the other two strongly components are there as well. You see that in graph terms, it actually, it mat matrix terms, it corresponds into permuting to a block triang uh, triangular form. Depth first search Tarjan, we know depth first search is inherently sequential, but what can we do uh, to get more parallelism is a divide and conquer idea, uh, which is due to Fleischer, Hendrickson, and Panache, and it's gonna be, gonna be the last thing I'm gonna show in technical terms as the idea is you partition the graph into disjoint subgraphs. 
and each of those graphs can be processed independently. So here's the main lemma. Let's define as forward of V is the vertices that are reachable from V, like all the outgoing uh, set of vertices, and including the paths, reachability question. And backwards of V is all the vertices from which V is reachable from. So all the things that can reach to V is backwards of V. Uh, the intersection of the forward of V and the backward of V is a strongly connected component by itself. By definition, everything can reach to everyone else. Great. Uh, but you, you've ident now we've identified one strongly con connected component by just looking, picking a vertex, finding its forward set, finding its backward set, intersecting them. Now we find a strongly connected component. For every other strongly connected component is either only uh, uh, strictly contained in the forward set, not in the intersection, strictly contained in the backward set, or uh, is a completely disconnected piece. But uh, the crux is all these ABC conditions are independent from each other. A strongly connected component cannot be both in A or C or something like that. Once you do the splitting, you pick the pivot, you, you pick its uh, uh, finest strongly connected component that it belongs to, that automatically splits the graph into pieces and now you can work in parallel for the other pieces and you can recursively apply the idea. And the, the picture here is about, I think, we picked a, a pivot and this was the strongly connected component that pivot created. And once you split it and permuted it, you created something like that. I'm not exactly sure. Actually. Okay, final couple minutes. I'm gonna wrap up with uh, a couple of things that uh, you should be aware of if you design your own parallel graph algorithms. You should always think about the locality challenge. We repeatedly saw that by just reordering the data accesses, you can get tremendous uh, performance increases. And um, just this example, you can see that if you get your algorithm, don't think about locality and just increase the problem size on a fixed per machine the number of edges traversed per second keeps dropping. And you, you don't expect this, right? The problem is fixed. No, the problem is not fixed, but hey, uh, this is a performance measure, measure that should be fixed depending, uh, irrespective of the problem size. But since you're doing more and more cache misses and, uh, and other kind of uh, uh, TL, TLB misses and so on, your performance uh, keeps dropping. Uh, Second is the scaling challenge. Um, most of the algorithms we learn, learn in textbooks for graphs are actually uh, not suitable for parallel computing. So you will need to take care, uh, think about a lot of real world issues. And um, you should think about what kind of graph I have, uh, whether it uh, has skewed degrees, all the things that we've talked earlier in the class, whether it's sparse enough for uh, this algorithm to be beneficial and so on. And you should remember that the techniques to parallelize these graphs are sometimes uh, at loggerheads with techniques with enhancing memory locality. What I mean with that is to get load balance, you permute the data. You kind of create some sort of random hash, uh, random distribution. But randomness destroys the locality and you're losing a lot of performance. And there is no easy solution. You have to find the right balance at some point for high performance. But Keep in mind that they're actually, when you're fixing something, you're actually breaking something else. And a lot of other things. So uh, that's the picture to take home is you should look at you know, what is my data size, what is the work that the algorithm needs to uh, uh, perform, this excess, and whether the locality is stream-like, meaning that it's only uh, it's all contiguous accesses or completely random accesses, and then you'll need to design your algorithm to make sure that it doesn't hit any of the corner cases. Here's the conclusions. Your best algorithm depends on your input today and probably for several decades to come. Uh, communication costs are going to be crucial for distributed memory, so you can't ignore them anymore. You can't ignore locality as well. Uh, most of the algorithms uh, use graph traversals, so um, Studying them first would be beneficial uh, to understand higher level algorithms. And keep in mind that the best algorithm can be very different than the, the best serial algorithm. 
So don't always try to lift your favorite graph algorithm from textbook. Uh, think about how much parallelism it has or whether it makes sense to just port it. Thank you. So uh, Aiden is around uh, all the time at LBL and uh, at the Bebop meetings on Monday, so he's certainly around to ask questions about class projects or future work of any kind. But if yeah. this is a good time for questions, but uh, you can always save them for later, too. So let me add that on Thursday, our speaker will be Professor Kurt Koitzer, who's going to be talking about patterns, uh, not the computational patterns that we've talked about so much, but the next higher level, structural patterns that come up over and over again and how you use them to compose the computational patterns. Okay. I mean, there's, my email address is in the first slide, so if you want to uh, speak to me or anything, just shoot me an email, and I, we can set up an appointment.